Welcome to another recorded lecture of the course Literature and Identity in the Middle East. I'm Dr. Nikolsky and I'm the teacher and coordinator of this course. The first part of the course is dedicated to studying an analytic method called textual theory, which we then use to analyze literature from the Middle East. We follow the introductory book describing this method called Textual Theory and Introduction, written by Joanna Gavins. And we then analyze short stories from the anthology Gaza Writes Back, which was compiled by Rifat al Arir. And you can find links to these two books in the description below. The second part of the course focuses on identity issues in Palestinian society. Today I talk about chapter five of the book, Textual Theory and Introduction by Joanna Gavins. The chapter is titled Layers. This chapter is the first in a group of three chapters titled Layers, this one, Attitudes, chapter six, and Distances, chapter seven. And these three chapters talk about three ways in which the text, rather the, the author, through the text, is manipulating the mind of the reader or the hearer. Manipulating, of course, not in a bad sense. Uh, what I mean by manipulating is uh, how the, 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 uh, the text, or the, the author is creating text worlds in the mind of the listener or the readers in ways which are implicit, not, not very open, not straightforward. So now chapters five, layers, then as usual, analyzing stories, ending uh, with your assignment for the week. Before I start uh, talking about chapter five, I want to give a short overview of what uh, will be in the future in the book. So we started with some theoretical issues regarding language and uh, narratives and texts. And then we looked into world building elements and processes. And now we are starting to look into not only what is the setup and the events in a narrative, in a textual narrative, but also look at some tricks or particular ways of expression which help create a certain text world in the mind of the reader or the listener. So today we will talk about layers, and this is talking about how accessible, that is how much information does the listener know about a text world that is created and what this level of knowledge depends upon. In chapter uh, six, we will talk about attitudes, which are uh, certain attitudes that we have toward the text world or which are attitudes that a character in, in, uh, in the narrative has toward the text world that they are creating. And uh, we will talk about two uh, attitudes of Bulomaic and Deontic. In chapter seven, we will talk about distances and this will be talking about the epistemic status of a text world. What is the level of knowledge about the text world, which the creator of the text world has or says that they have? In chapter eight, we will talk about narratives, especially about focalization, about how we receive a particular point of view of the, of the text world through focalization, but um, without world switching or completely moving to a different, uh, uh, a new deictic center. And in chapter nine, we will talk about metaphors. It is called double vision in textual theory. So this will be it. So now to chapter five about layers. So in the context of chapter three and four, we talked about world building elements that establish the text world and relational processes that give more details about the world building elements. And we learned about processes that move the story forward 
These are called function advancing propositions in text world terms. We talked about world switches, a different text world which is introduced into the current one. The topic of the current chapter, layers, talks about world switches and focuses on the hierarchy between them. The term hierarchy here means the accessibility of the various text worlds created in the discourse. Gavin resorts again to this illustration to describe the hierarchy. It is a hierarchy that goes sideways, so to speak. The idea has to do with the level of reliability of the teller. And according to this, our assessment of the text world, this teller creates. We conceptualize a reality that we know as being close to us. And the less known it is, the further it is from us. Gavin says on page 82, the information that other human beings present to us through spoken and written language exists outside of their deictic center. Here she means that it is outside the here and now of the speaker and the listener. We conceptualize this information as close to or further away from us according to our evaluation of the reliability of both its origin and its content, its origin referring to the, the teller. For example, we often express our understanding of knowledge and particularly our notion of what is true and what is not through conceptual metaphors of perception, that is sensory perception. Phrases such as, I can see what you mean, it is clear he knows what he's talking about, and my senses tell me you're lying, show that we understand the abstract notion of truth in terms of our bodily senses. So we can see that the world of literature is, in fact, a transformation of sensory experience. In a discourse world, where two people actually talk to each other, the listeners have much information in order to make a decision regarding the level of reliability, not only the words of the teller, but also gestures, his or her social status, type of personality, and so forth. All of this is added as information to the text world the teller is creating. In the split discourse world, as, as we will soon see it in Gavin's uh, example, the reader has much less information about the author or the implied author or the teller. In narratology, we differentiate between the real person who is the author who wrote the story and the authorial voice in the story, which is different from the real person. It is a certain persona the real person puts on, so to speak, when becoming an author. This is called the implied author. Still further, in first uh, person stories, the teller is a third category who can be different from the implied author. The teller can be a child when the implied author uh, is a mature person, etc. The teller can be a protagonist, the protagonist of the story, the main character in the story. And then this person goes through the events in the story and also tells about them or not. He, he, the teller could be a side character who tells about the protagonist in the third person. And the teller is then someone from the story or not from the story, but not the main character. So we have the author, which is a person outside the story, the implied author, which is the authorial voice in the story, even when we persona doesn't say anything, just tells the story. Someone is always telling the story. Or there could be a teller inside the story who is either a main character in the story, a side character in the story, or none at all. All these possibilities are there. The fact that how much the listeners know depends on reliability of the author is a known issue in narratology as well as in linguistics. Here uh, in this lecture, we hear about the importance of teller reliability 
in the discourse world in an Amazonian language called Piraha. This is told by Daniel Everett, who spent a few years living among, among uh, this remote tribe with a language very different from our languages. He wrote the book, Don't Sleep, There Are Snakes, where he tells about his life in the Amazon and about the special language of this tribe, the Piraha. Well, Pitaha, like many American Indian languages, has a very complex verbal system. So the Pitaha has 16 different suffixes that can go at the end of a verb. That gives two to the 16th power possible verb forms, and, and that's a lot. That's more than 40. Uh, and of those things, three suffixes are very important, and those tell you how you got your evidence. So every verb has to have on it the source of the evidence. Did you hear about it? Did you see it with your own eyes, or did you deduce it from the local evidence? Uh, so if I say, did John go fishing? They can say, John went fishing, he I, which means I heard that he did. Or they can say, John went fishing, Sibiga, uh, and uh, that means uh, I deduced that he did. Or they can say, John went fishing, ha, and that means uh, I saw it, he went. Um, in some respects, they're the ultimate empiricists, or like uh, people from Missouri, the show me state. <clears throat> Part of this cultural value of the Pinaha, the immediacy of experience reflected in this word ibipiu, uh, produces a value to keep information slow and to keep it verifiable. And it must be witnessed. So as a Christian missionary, which I no longer am, if you read the book, you will find out what they did to me. Uh, <laughs> They actually demanded evidence for what I believed, and I realized I couldn't give it as well as they wanted me to give it. So uh, <clears throat> uh, this changed me profoundly. Uh, but I, I remember telling them about Jesus one time, and they said, um, so Dan, uh, Jesus, is he uh, brown like us, or is he white like you? Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen him. Well, what did your dad say? Because your dad must have seen him. No, he never saw him. Well, what did your friends say who saw him? Uh, I don't have nobody. I don't know anybody who saw him. Why are you telling us about him then? <laughs> so, in Piraha, the source of information is always part of the discourse, so the listener can assess easily how reliable information is. We don't have it embedded in our language in such a structural manner. Let us look now at uh, the example which Gavin studies in her book. Uh, this extract is taken from a parenting manual called The Baby Whisperer Answers All Your Questions by Teaching You How to Ask the Right Questions. The Baby Whisperer is Tracy Hogg a British former pediatric nurse who had a hugely successful career as a parenting advisor on television and in print, first in the United States and later in the United Kingdom and Australia. In this section of her third publication, Hogg addresses the problems associated with training toddlers to use, to use the toilet. It is Hogg's aim in this book in this split discourse world communication to be the authority and give advice about caring for babies. And the listener reader's aim in this communication is to receive such an advice. So establishing Hogs as the authority is a major task of this communication. I found that toilet troubles are caused, at least in part, by parents' lack of follow through. They start, in my opinion, too late, and then at the first sign of resistance, stop and start again, and they continue to stop and start again and before they know it, they are into a battle of wills. You'll see that theme in many of the following cases. My almost 22-month-old son, Carson, started saying pee-pee last week. 
I asked him did he have to go PP or has he already done PP? I didn't really get a response one way or the other. He has not shown any readiness for toilet training. Should I try putting him on the potty when he says PP? At his age, Carson understands everything. I also don't agree that he hasn't shown any readiness. Let us see how Hog is establishing herself as an authority for us about babies. The enactor Hog is obviously the strongest authorial presence in the book. The enactor Hog is presenting her opinion in the first person. I have. But she's also using a second person plural, or could be even a singular in English. You will see that theme which makes the readers included in the text world next to Hogg. Other enactors appear and disappear, like Carlson's mother that we see here, uh, in the world switch created by Hogg. But the stable relationship, so to speak, is Hogg and the reader, and it is also exclusive, as we have I and you talking. This is getting as close as possible to face-to-face -to -face interaction within a split discourse world. The new text world of Carlson Mother has a new deictic center, the eye of the mother, around whom we find Carlson, the bathroom, the father, etc. The mother is uncertain and hesitating in presenting her opinion. And indeed, at the moment the text ends, we get Hogg's opinion. Hogg has no doubts, and she disagrees with Carlson Mother. While the mother says he has not shown any readiness for toilet training, Hogg is saying, I also don't agree that he hasn't shown any readiness. By putting down Carlson's mother, Hogg establishes her authority as well as, well as her intimacy with the reader. The words which uh, Hogg creates is to a zone of timeless uh, quality, a quotation from a letter or from another conversation. As Hogg presents it, it is in many following cases, and it is what she found. So she is the one filtering this information as a result of her experience. What we recognize from studying this text is that there is a hierarchy in text worlds with regard to how accessible they are to different enactors involved. Whether the communication is taking place face to face or through a written text, the text worlds created by the participants are open for verification by the other entities who exist in the same ontological level. In the discourse world, the real world, so to speak, both parties are on the same ontological level, the same level of existence, and the text worlds they create are accessible to both, as they can inquire about it, clarify or negotiate the information until they reach a common understanding. These text worlds are, in text world theory terms, Participant Accessible Text Worlds. We think of people in the split discourse world as real people, and although, although this particular real person may not share our spatial or temporal co, uh, coordinates, he or she still exists in the same ontological domain as we do. The willful nature of all communication leads us to expect as a norm that our co-participants in a discourse world are telling the truth. Lying is considered pathological behavior in most uh, discourse world environments. This means that when a participant in a discourse world, and this could be a teller in a story, so even in a split discourse world, establishes a text world or creates a new world within the text world, for example, through a world switch, the other participants in the discourse world will accept 
this content, the, the contents of those te text worlds as reliable and true and a corresponding degree of responsibility for them is assigned as to the speaker himself or herself. This is what happens with Hong. She is an, an actor in a text who is relatively speaking very close to, to the reader, as we pointed out. So the text world she creates, telling what she found about parenting and toilet training, seems to be accessible to us, to the readers. But when she creates a text world through World Switch, where there is an actor who is not a participant in the discourse or split discourse world, that is not the speaker, not the author, not even the first person teller, we can only rely on the character in the text about what is said. As we have no access to this text world, then we talk about an actor accessible text world. So in the case of Gavin's example about Hogg, the reader tends to believe Hogg's testimony because the reader knows her from the real world and, and therefore trusts her. And also she worked to create the relationship with the reader by referring to them as you. The reader then accepts Hogg, uh, Hogg's belittling assessment of Carlson mother. And by this, she is also magnifying herself as well as flattering the readers who join in with her. No wonder Hogg comes out of this text with even more authority than before. The important aspect that we learn here is not only that there's hierarchy in the text worlds, but that authors, tellers, or characters in the text have various levels of reliability. We trust some of them and don't trust others. We think of some that they know what they are uh, talking about and others not. And this determines our feeling about how much we really know about the text world created inside the story. This feature is very important with regard to the group stories, as in all cases, in all the stories, the reliability of the author is not simple. It's actually quite shaky. Let us look now how to indicate accessibility in text world uh, diagrams. There's actually not much innovation here in terms of the diagram. It is the same world switches of which we learned earlier, only that Gavin marks, marks here the accessibility. Uh, so let's just have a quick look here. So as you can see here on the left, the text world with the time, the present, the enactors, which is Hog and the reader. And right away, uh, we see the world switches. So the first world switch, world switch one, is participant accessible. This is how Hog is establishing, one of the ways she establishes her authority is by talking about her experience with uh, parents that they start and stop, start and stop training their children, uh, toilet training their children. And this, she says, is the problem. And she's basing this opinion on the example, which is going to now show us in the world switch to yeah, in a different text world, which is actually only accessible to her. And this is what she says about Carlson's mother. So this is the speech time and the actor is calls, uh, Carlson, his mother, his father. And we have word switches here as well to word switch three, which is inside the in, only in actor accessible. And it's also only in actor accessible is, uh, where uh, Carlson and his mother talk and she recognized that he started saying PP. And then there's another world switch into world switch four, whereas Carlson and his mother and his father in the bathroom and he sees, and what he sees that world switch five, 
his mother and father are going potty. But all these text words, which are word switches from the uh, basic ones, which are world, sw uh, world switch two, world switch three, four, and five, are all are all only accessible to Hog, to the enactor. Yeah, and she establishes her authority based on this, which is only accessible to her. Yeah, so the only innovation here is that we see here written as participant ac uh, accessible and an actor accessible, and we only have to mark these uh, if, if it's relevant, yeah, if, if these are relevant issues. Now we will look at some stories from Gaza Rights Back. First, uh, let us look at the story we saw last week, Spared. So the story spared, as you know, by uh, Rawan uh, Yaghi begins with the protagonist standing on the balcony, not being allowed to go out and play soccer with his friends, especially Ahmed, the nameless protagonist's best friend. If you read the story until the end, you know that what happens there is that a bomb fell on the playing children. Many of them were wounded and became crippled, and Ahmed was killed. The protagonist, who did not go out to play, was spared relative to the others, even though he was uh, slightly wounded too. The story is told in the first person, the teller being the child who was not allowed uh, to go out and play and was angry with his mother because of this. Of course, when you know the end of the story, this anger should be replaced with a feeling of gratitude or awe at the action of the mother, which now seems miraculous, as it probably saved the boy's life. We will not know for sure why the mother stopped the boy from going out. It, was it really because lunchtime was close, or she had some premonition, or perhaps she generally is a careful person. Let us see now how the child, who is the teller and the protagonist, even though Ahmed gets a big chunk of the story, how the child is telling what the new situation after the bomb fell, Ahmed died and others were wounded, the new situation with regard to the neighborhood and the people in it is. The first two descriptions are preparing uh, the final one. Ahmed was gone. The others haunted me with their blaming looks every day I went to school. I couldn't look at them. Amputated limbs. Scarred faces. Limping gates. Our neighborhood was blown to smithereens in a split second. No more games were played. No more goals. No more cheering. And my friends grew up in one second. They no longer looked at me the same way they used to before that awful day. They wouldn't come out to play. And they had a distant look. Like Uncle Abu Ahmed when he looked at me, like I didn't understand, like they knew something I did not know, like I did something wrong. So the first description framed here in red. The boy is telling about his experience. Ahmed is dead. But the ones who are haunted, haunting him are the live ones, the other friends. Those who were wounded and crippled by the bomb. And the boy cannot look at them. The situation he is describing, the crippled friends, is described together with his experience of it, of not being able to look at them. Here the friends uh, do not do anything against the boy. They just, they are just there, crippled by the attack. Uh, but he is the one who cannot look. The next section is this one, framed in blue. Here is a description of the changes that took place in the neighborhood itself. The neighborhood is gone, children's, uh, children don't play, and he, uh, the protagonist, does not cheer on the balcony because there are no more goals. So this section, the third section here, the end of the uh, story is marked in green. 
let us uh, analyze it using a textual theory diagram. So the idea, uh, it starts off with the world building elements of the friends that have a distant look. Uh, and then if we move down to the uh, processes before we go to the world switch, uh, the friends grew up in one second, the friends no longer look in the same way and the friends don't come out to play. Yeah, so this is what is happening, so to speak, in the story. Uh, but besides having the uh, distant look, there's a world switch, which already is part of the qualities of the friends, the relational process of the friends. And this is uh, done using a world switch to a different deictic center, which is now Uncle Abu Ahmed, the father of Ahmed. He also has a distant look. Yeah? So that's why he is mentioned here, because the friends remind the boy of him when he looked, uh, when his son died. And from there, we have our world switch, which is describing what happened to Abu Ahmed according to the boy. Yeah? So the boy is making this world switch into world switch two, as you can see here they knew something i didn't know yeah so here the boy is making statements about what is in the mind of the person who he introduces in a word switch yeah? a new text world that he introduces i introduce a new person abu ahmad abu ahmad has something in his mind he knows something that i don't know and what is this so he's making a world switch again into what Abu Ahmad thinks is something that the boy doesn't know. And this thing is that I did something wrong. Yeah. So Abu Ahmad knows that the boy did something wrong and the boy doesn't know it. Yeah. So the boy is introducing Abu Ahmad and the, uh, from there he introduces Abu Ahmad's mind based on the distant look. And what is in the mind of Abu Ahmad, the boy seems to know, even though it is something that the boy doesn't know. And so the very sophisticated buildup of worlds here. The idea that the boy expresses, I did something wrong, is put by the boy in the mind of Abu Ahmad, or perhaps his friends and Abu Ahmad, because they have a look that he categorizes as distant. Is it really a distant look? It depends to what extent we uh, find the boy's analysis of the look reliable. Perhaps we do indeed. But then we hear him again saying that what it is that they knew is that he, the boy, did something wrong. Here we begin to suspect the accuracy of his analysis and our experience as adults come into action. We see here what the boy cannot see as clearly because of his involvement and because of his young age. Of course, he did nothing wrong. We know as adults, it is a feeling of guilt that makes him experience uh, what happened in this way, as if he did something wrong. To feel guilty because he didn't join his friends and uh, because he's the only one who didn't get seriously hurt. We see the tragic situation more than the teller, who is a young boy, can see, in spite of the fact that he is the one who gives us all the information. This is a result of our assessment of the personality of the teller from our, based on our experience in the real world as adults. We know that this is how the boy understands it, but we know that he's not right in understanding it in this way or not necessarily right. And we don't know if everyone blames him, but he, we see that he blames himself and we know the deepness of the tragedy because this guilt feeling is something that he will carry with him throughout his life. And it is as bad, if not more, uh, as any physical wounds 
that he could have had. The story Canary tells about a young man who, as we learn, remembers his loving and supportive uh, mother who tried to protect him and his loving and supportive uh, brother, Bazan, who tried to make him realize uh, his dream, the boy's dream of carrying heavy bags uh, to show his strength, uh, etc. And then was shot by uh, a Jewish settler in Gaza when he tried to bring the canary to the boy. We meet this young man as a stranger in a park on a mission to suicide bomb himself in the middle of Jewish population. The story also tells about a young woman and her sad childhood memories of a dysfunctional mother whose attention she, she could not get, the child, the little girl could not get, and her feeling of loneliness at home. We meet the young woman as a soldier circling around the young man. She finds him familiar. There's something in his face that makes her want to occupy his world. As it says on page 56, not accidentally evoking a political association. The intricate weaving of details about the two characters creates them as harmonizing one with the other, as well as being the opposite one of the other. Opposite as one is from a loving fam family, the other from a neglecting one, one on the verge of acting against the regime, the other working for the regime. He was going on a self-bombing attack because this brought him a relief from his memories. For her, the army work brought a relief, a relief from her bad family and bad love life. They are similar because they are at the same place at the same time. The park, the heat, seeing the mother and the playing child that evoke memories in both. They both found each other attractive, each because of their own opposite memories. The movement of the young woman makes the two get closer and closer to each other physically. The man sits without moving and the woman is getting closer to him in space as part of her job. But they also get close mentally as her memories and his memories intertwine into one event which culminates in seeing the boy playing ball uh, and showing off to his mother. All the memories are uh, world switches and all memories on all world switches are influencing what is happening in the actual plot of the story. The man sitting, the woman circling, the increasing spatial proximity, which ends with an explosion that kills them both. The world switches thus make very clear what the people's identity is. Their identity is a result of their memories, which are told in the world switches in the story. And the identity is the reason for the tragic end and the reason behind everything that is happening in the story. Had it not been for the identity, simply a young man and a young woman in a park finding each other attractive does not have to end in uh, such a tragedy. Here's a very tragic romantic ending of the story. Uh, I don't think we need to make a textual theory um, diagram here, uh, but if we did, it would work with the uh, word switches into the memory as creating the identity of both uh, partner in the story. Now for the stories of the story groups. All three stories of the story groups are relevant to the study of layers. As in all three, the status of the teller is important for understanding the story. The teller of the story is also an important an actor 
uh, in the story, in uh, most cases, whether they know it or not. We therefore get information about what happens in the story from someone who is part of the occurrences, part of the events. So the, in all three, the notion of the layers is very important because either the teller or the protagonist, and sometimes it is the same person, are the main source of information about what happens in the story. In the swimming contest of um, S. Izhar, the teller is also the protagonist in the story, and the teller's point of view tints all the events in the story in a certain color and endows them with a certain meaning which otherwise would not, uh, we would not have had. Also, Nomads and, uh, Nomad and Viper of Amos Oz, the teller is a character in the story, albeit not the protagonist, but he ha has had a strong influence on the protagonist, the woman Geula, and he seems not to be aware of this uh, influence. This portrays him in a certain manner, as well as the story he tells uh, to the reader. In uh, Facing the Forest, the third story, A.B. Uh, Yehoshua, the story is not told in a first person, uh, by a first person teller, but it is, but it almost is. Yeah, this is called a uh, focalization and we will learn about it later on. In this case, we can almost uh, hear the protagonist talk, even though the story is told in a third person. Also here, our understanding of what is happening depends on what the protagonists, uh, depends on the protagonist's understanding. And the protagonist uh, does not understand everything in the beginning of the story. Things uh, sort of un uh, unveil themselves uh, slowly. So for your work in the story group, try to find place where your knowledge of the events depends on the teller and assess how reliable the teller is. Yeah, this is the assignment for the uh, story group work. And for the weekly assignment, Read the story, Will I Ever Get Out, which you can find on the learning platform, and try to formulate to yourself what is the relationship between the story and the teller, the first person teller. For your assignment, explain how accessible the text worlds are, looking at the self-awareness of the protagonist regarding his role among his workmates and at the end of the story. Submit your assignment in the form of a short video, which you can film using the assignment link. Work also as usual in the group story. Uh, this was specified earlier in the lecture. And submit your assignment in the assignment link found below this lecture. The date and time of submissions are indicated on the learning platform. Thank you for listening and see you next time.